Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. I want you to paint an image according to how you just saw me. The results of anthropometric facial measurements of the key points of the face from the shroud and the painting by Eugeniusz Kazimierowski show a perfect convergence between the image of Jesus from the Shroud of Turin and the image that was created with the participation of Saint Sister Faustina. Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Mastery, and today I am here with Father Kaz Schwalik of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. And today we are talking about the incredible true life story of St. Faustina and Divine Mercy, as it appears in the new movie, Love and Mercy, Faustina, which will be appearing in theaters nationwide, over 700 theaters, um, on October 28th. Hello and welcome, Father Kaz. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. The incredible true story of St. Faustina is coming to theaters and everybody's excited to hear, you know, what is your involvement with this movie? Uh, if you could give us some insight. It goes back to 16 months ago. Yeah, I received this phone call and a couple of messages on my cell phone. And finally I was able to respond to, uh, to this caller and I found out it was Michael and he wanted to talk to me. I asked him, how did he get my name? And he said somebody else suggested I should, that he should call me. His wish and desire was to produce a movie about Divine Mercy and St. Faustina. And uh, so he gave me a little description as to what he wanted to do and some of the research that he has already done. And he asked me if, if we could help him. And so my role was at the beginning was more like a consultor. Then I ended up being more translator, and then he, he dragged me in, I would have to say, into, into the production itself. And you know, I offered some guidelines and assistance. So, so it is something that I, I think that I felt very much as part of my life. You know, I've been doing this, I've been promoting Divine Mercy for 39 years already. So, so and I've known quite a bit of background and history of, of both the message and, and the life of St. Faustina. So it was something natural for me to share. But I have to say that uh, when I heard his desire and his wish is that this message of God's mercy may be known throughout the world. He said that today's people do not read. And then he gave a description of his own life. He says, you know, 19 years ago, my sister gave me a, a copy of a diary and I didn't crack it open. I didn't even look at it. But then she realized that I was, not, I was not reading it. So she gave me an audio tape of the diary. And then she left it in my car. And that's how he described. And, and, and he says, one day I was just driving and I put this tape on. And he says, and, and this, this, this uh, audio version of the diary, he says, really touched my heart and began to change me. This really changed my life, he said. And so he gave the description of his own growth, of his coming to know this divine mercy. He was a business person, so he was not involved with that. But then he realized that he wanted to have other people also come to know her. And the best way for today's world is that people are not reading or not reading much. And so if I produce a movie, a film, then they will be watching it. And I wanted to give the essence of the diary through this movie. So, and I think he did, did succeed because he gave both the, uh, the, the story of St. Faustina as well as of her life and, you know, Father Sapochko, her spiritual director, but he also gave uh, the possibility of people to witness what has happened to them once they embrace this message, what, what happened in their life. And it's really, really great to see that. 
Could you tell us more about the inspiration for this movie, how it all began, what it hopes to achieve? Well, you know, you know the inspiration, Michael would say that it was a diary. The diary was, was actually the, the inspiration. Obviously, we cannot say that just a book because it's God who touches hearts. It's God who inspires. And uh, several years ago, like four years ago, uh, a friend of his, an acquaintance of his, he says, could you do some, produce movies? He always wanted to be, be a movie director and producer. But in this case, he felt that he needs to do something to evangelize the world. And he wants to produce Catholic films. And he wants to produce not only Catholic films, but quality Catholic films. So that when people watch it, they will be pulled in. They will be able to respond. It wasn't just something like, okay, um, you know, a little story about St. Faustina. But he wanted to have a quality, quality productions. And I think that he's succeeding. I think that he is succeeding because he wants people to come to know the Lord, his mercy. Uh, he wants them to be healed, to be touched through a medium that is very powerful in today's world. Very good. St. Faustina doesn't appear in this movie for past the first 37 minutes, but her performance is powerful and, and subtle. Uh, what does this movie em emphasize most about her life? I think that, um, yeah, it is true that portion of the movie is about her and, and it's a narrative, a story of her life and life of Father Sporchko. But what, what this movie emphasizes is, is how she, touched by the Lord, responded to him. And she wanted to be faithful to him in every way. And, and so this movie does capture, you know, that, that invitation that she received from the Lord and, and not only the invitation, but what she did with her life. Look at, she was a simple, uneducated person. She had two and a half years of education. Can you imagine today, somebody said, you know, two and a half years of elementary school, what would your life look like, you know? It's probably, a, you know, you may be a cleaning person or something, you know, to make some living. But look what God did for her and through her. She said yes to him, and look what happened. She said yes completely. She did not put any conditions. She said, I, I will do everything that you ask me to do. Listening to him, being in communion with him, and fulfilling his will. Why a docudrama, um, and, and what is the significance behind the scientific information presented in this film? I think that the docudrama is probably a very appropriate uh, means for to communicating this message, because docudrama is because drama is because of the narrative. So we enter into her life, into the life of, of her spiritual director, the communications painter, and all the other people who are there. But then the docu dimension, you know, the docu drama, is it it tells us what happens to people when they embrace this message. Okay, so for example, we have this uh, scientific research. I know that Father Seraphim, who is here, uh, you know, and uh, he can say a little bit more about that. But he discovered the congruence between the image of divine mercy and uh, and the the image of the shroud. But now in this movie. What we see is a scientist, uh, or at least a person who does a scientific research, and sees the congruence of this image, which means if, if you were to look at the Divine Mercy image and, and actually examine it scientifically and look at the shroud, you can see the total points of convergence, identity. But now we have to remember that St. Faustina uh, asked the painter at least 10 times to change the face because every time he painted it, he didn't do it the right way. So she asked him to redo it and redo it. And only towards the end when Jesus said, it's okay, even if it's not perfect. Now this image, when the Lord says it's okay, now it completely overlaps or is congruent with the Shroud of Turin, the image. I mean, so, I mean you're talking about some special grace here. Mm. Films and digital media can have such a lasting impact on society today. What does the work of the producer of this movie, Michael Kondrat, um, what does his decision to take up this challenge to make Divine Mercy into a film, what does this say about how Catholics ought to approach uh, the culture of today? Well, you know, I have to say that I am happy that Michael 
Conrad has chosen this means to bring uh, the gospel message, Catholic faith into the audiences. It's not just Catholic faith because, you know, everybody is in need of God's mercy and, and forgiveness and love. But I think that choosing, choosing to, um, to do so in, the, in this form of media, he opens the possibilities of not only uh, English-speaking cultures, he opens the possibilities to everyone because we can dub it, we can sub- have the subtitles. And, and, and it has a lasting effect because, you know, 20 years down the road, people can still watch it. Uh, yes, you know, there can be great performances in theater, uh, which, which are great. But, you know, you go there and unless it's filmed, it's, it's gone. You know, it may have an effect on you. But here, this is a permanent effect. I mean, look at some of the movies from 1950s. Some of the Catholic movies on, you know, St. Bernadette, uh, Subaru, St. Bernadette. I mean, you just look, you can still watch it today. It, it has a self, uh, you know, powerful, uh, lasting value, you know, for, for every generation. And I think in this case, the message of God's mercy, the message of his mercy has no, no limit. There's no time limit. Every human being on this earth if you look at Judeo-Christian tradition, 4,000 years, Abraham received his, his love and mercy. He received the grace of, of that loving kindness. M- Moses, the prophets, uh, we'll, take, we'll take our world into the gospel. Uh, no time, uh, you know, St. Paul, St. Peter, you know, and today too, we have the same need. And that's why this particular way of, 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 of uh, creating this sort of permanent witness and means of formation and education is one of the best things we can do. You want to go to any convent? I won't allow it! Why have you chosen us? I asked the Lord and he led me here. I will grant you a visible help. He will help you carry out my will. Jesus told me that you will be my confessor. Who told you? Jesus. Write all these words in your diary. These words you are certain Jesus taught you himself. I can't do it without you. I'll be supporting you to the very end. Father Seraphim is a member of the Marian Fathers and has been spreading the message of divine mercy for 70 years. He was the vice postulator for the cause of canonization in North America of St. Faustina's canonization and beatification. Welcome, Father Seraphim. Thanks. This new movie, Love and Mercy, uh, is very exciting. What is your association with it? I was asked precisely to uh, take part in it because for 20 years of the 70, I was vice postulator for the cause, and so supposedly know quite a bit about it. (laughs) Sometimes God is misunderstood as vengeful or wrathful. How does this movie, um, or how does the message of divine mercy set the record straight, the true nature of God? Well, I don't know if it sets the record straight because uh, it's just like when we speak of the wrath of God, it's not a change of mood in God, but it is the way a person receives it according to where they're at. And uh, some see it as vengeful and hurtful, and others see it as uh, truly welcoming. So much depends upon a person's uh, relationship with the divinity to see how they interpret him. But as far as we know from sacred scripture, and of course the experience of many people who are close to God, his mood doesn't change. It's always turned upon us with love and mercy. When did someone discover a connection between the shroud and the image of divine mercy? Oh, that was a story of a group from um, Arizona called Life Foundation. They would go around with presentations asking people to be involved in the prayer uh, for the eradication of abortion in the world. And they would hand out an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, who is considered the patroness of the unborn. 
And while they were making the presentations, they felt something was missing. And as they prayed over it, uh, I believe it was a priest who was a chaplain to the group, said he believes that an image of Jesus, the divine mercy, revealed through Sister Faustina, also ought to be distributed to people uh, as incentives uh, in their prayer meetings to remember that special intention. And so they found out that I was involved in the process and asked me if I had a um, negative of the original image that they could reproduce, uh, not only in a small, small fashion that they were equal to one they were distributing about Our Lady Guadalupe, but also some priests said they would want bigger posters uh, for their churches that the little ones wouldn't do. And uh, so I gave them the uh, negative that I was given by uh, what was given to one of our priests who was a great propagator of the uh, message. And uh, they had it enlarged to a, a six-foot poster. They didn't know what the original measurements of the original image were, but they wanted it big enough for a church. So when uh, it came off the press, the group had a meeting in the founder's house. And uh, as they unrolled one of the posters, light from the uh, corridor in the house lit it up from behind. And uh, the, the founder looked at it and he said, well, in the chaplet of divine mercy, we say, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us. But we're looking at the glorious Christ after his resurrection. And uh, the gentleman who would go around with them to provide music for the presentations said, but there is an image that shows the passion, and that is the Shroud of Turin. And uh, the young lady who was part of the group said, somebody sent us a uh, print of the upper part of the shroud. Um, so she went to find it and brought it out to compare the two. And that print was much smaller than uh, the actual one of the shroud. But for some reason or other, she couldn't explain it. Instead of just putting it side by side, she put it over the image of the divine mercy. And as the light shone through, the faces matched practically perfectly. And who could have known that it would be the same size as the print? And they called me immediately to tell me what they discovered. And I, well, I was surprised. Uh, but as we looked further into the matter and we read and know from the witness of Sister Faustina's confessor, the events around the painting, he did not have a model. In fact, after the first presentation of the face, Faustina didn't like it. And she said, no, you have to change it. And uh, in the process of painting from January to June in 1934, um, he had to redo it about 10 times. He wanted to quit, actually. But the confessor said, please, I have to see how this thing finishes. Be patient with her. And he was, and he, because he objected <laughs> quite a bit. To, to having to do this every time she came to, to keep on uh, telling him what the image should look like. And uh, so we only know that after the war began in Poland, September the 1st, 1939, the archbishop of the diocese, who up to that time did not permit Father to exhibit the image publicly, um, uh, in a church, as the Lord requested, the, the archbishop uh, realized that what Fasin was telling him was the truth, that there was going to be a great war burst out and that people would be suffering a lot. And he didn't believe her. Uh, even other things she told her, he just says, let's wait and see. And, uh, but since the war did break out, and precisely in Poland, and it wasn't even a whole year after her death, um, he gave permission to the confessor to tell the people where all this came from. And uh, uh, a nun was there. She copied down his whole talk. And she sent a copy of the manuscript to her sister in the United States. 
and it got into the hands of one of, one of our priests who was a great promoter of the message. And um, in it, there's this part. She finally came one day, uh, maintaining that the image is ugly, but that Jesus said, leave it in the state it's in. It's not good, but it will do. You don't have to change it anymore. And it happened to match perfectly because when I had the chance to go to Turin and uh, show this combination to a photographer who had access to the plates from the uh, photos of Henri that are now used for investigation, um, he, I asked him to make me a photo the actual size of the shroud uh, with the combination of these two images. And he agreed to do so. And uh, I believe I was the first to ask for such a thing. And uh, then he gave me the whole description of how he did it and what he thought about it. And he said, I don't think you're going to like it because the eyes are looking down. And he says, on the shroud, there are no eyes. There are coins over the eyelids. But when the other image shines through, the eyes are looking down. And I says, well, uh, I don't see why I shouldn't like it. He says, well, why not? I says, well, we know the sister insisted that's how they have to be, even though the artist didn't want to do it that way. But he finally did. And uh, uh, then I mentioned that there is a passage in the diary without any explanation before or after. She just said, at one point, Jesus said, my gaze from this image is like the gaze from the cross. He says, well, then that image is miraculous. And that's how it came to be. And I think there's a part of it in the film showing that combination. Very good. And what did, what did that mean to you when you first put it together and realized, wow, this, one of the greatest uh, relics of Christ matches up well, I was convinced a long time that it's the genuine article from other matters that people don't pay attention to. Uh, but uh, this was an astounding uh, combination that really expresses exactly what Father Sopochko mentioned, that according to what he heard, how the face of Christ should look, a very uh, appealing in the sense of being tender and merciful. And... Uh, I have not seen any other combination of people who try to put the faces of Christ together as the one that comes forth from this image of which the Lord says, it's not good, but it will do. You don't have to change it anymore. And it is the most beautiful and expressive one that I've ever seen. Why do you think the world today in 2019 so much needs to hear the message of divine mercy? Actually, I believe the, the whole message of divine mercy through Sister Faustina is to serve as a preparation of this church for his return. And uh, uh, she herself said that the Lord assured her the world is not going to learn, uh, last for too much longer and that uh, he wants us all to be prepared for his return. And this is why the, the Feast of the Divine Mercy that he asked for is so important because it's connected with it is the very special uh, promise that those who on the first Sunday after Easter, uh, after having gone to confession and received Holy Communion on that day, will have complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. And this is what is necessary for the church, which is the bride of Christ, according to St. Paul in Ephesians. She must be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And that's what complete forgiveness of sins and punishment would be. The church offers that through a plenary indulgence under certain conditions. But here the Lord is speaking that with the reception of Holy Communion on that Sunday, all our sins and punishment, which would take out the wrinkles and any such thing, uh, would prepare the bride for his uh, return. Mm -hmm. So a film like this should help uh, supply wherever people have not heard of it to finally hear of it 
and act upon it. Very good. Thank you for watching. I encourage you to go out and see this awesome movie, Love and Mercy, Faustina, which will be in 700 theaters across the nation on October 28th. This has been Beyond the Vision. use media a lot in evangelization, so I believe in the importance of Catholic radio, Catholic TV, Catholics using the new media. Can I encourage everyone to watch Shalom TV? I think it's a great vehicle of evangelization. And God bless all of you.